Next we have uh, Dr. Radha D'Souza, who's a reader in law, specializing in international law and development, law in the third world societies and resource conflicts in the third world. She is a social justice and civil liberties activist working in India and internationally. And she's here to talk to us about industrialism, law, science, and imperialism. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how happy I am to be here today amongst all of you. Uh, I'm very happy to meet so many new people, but I will give two additional reasons for my delight in being here. The struggle in Rojava has inspired many of our young people in India, especially the student communities, where increasingly the politics of religious division, Hindus and Muslim politics, was really taking over. And this struggle has become like a inspiration that something different is possible. So, and that's one reason I'm very happy to be here. The second reason I'm very happy to be here is that the question of alternatives has been on our minds and in the debates among social movements of different types in India for a long time. And I'm very happy that I can share some of those discussions because what I'm about to say today comes from some of the thinking on alternatives within the South Asian subcontinent. So I'm very happy that we can have a larger conversation about this. I have been asked to speak on industrialism. That was the topic given to me. And the title that I have chosen or added on to it is Law, Science, and Imperialism. I propose to pose three questions, which I believe are the key to a new alternatives politics that I will call resistance with regeneration, because that's what we are looking for. They're not the resistance plus regeneration. I will not attempt to answer those questions today. Posing the right questions is, however, the first step to finding the right answers. My purpose today is to throw open some ideas for discussion about alternatives. My first point, and I want to make three points, my first point concerns my approach to questions of alternatives. I come to the question of alternatives from the standpoint of third world, which, in my view, the third world is the two-thirds world. My second point is that industrialism and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. And that's, that's the second thing. So imperialism and democracy can't coexist. My third point concerns our capacity to develop a new knowledge base for resistance with regeneration that challenges law, science, and imperialism. That's, that's the kind of condition. So I'll move on now to my first point for today, which is third world approaches to alternatives. In third world societies, industrialism and modernity was introduced by colonialism and imperialism. Modernity did not develop through internal contradictions within those societies. It was not the result of the trajectories of their own historical development. It was an external imposition by colonizing powers. This is true for all types of colonialism, whether they be settler colonialism or non-settler colonialism, whether it be direct rule or indirect rule, for example, the protectorate systems in some parts of the world, or whether it is economic colonialism, sometimes referred to as semi-colonialism. Regardless of the type of colonialism, modernity was an external imposition. In this respect, industrialism and modernity in third world societies is fundamentally different 
from industrialism and modernity in European societies and European settler societies. In European societies, modernity developed through their own internal contradictions, history and within the European cultural context. Capitalism evolved from within European societies in contestation with diverse, diverse social classes. The fact is central when speaking about alternatives. European industrialism plundered and pillaged and continues to plunder and pillage the natures, labors, and cultures of the entire colonial world. That's how capitalism has survived. Uh, we had slave labor, then we had indentured labor, and now we have migrant labor and sweatshops by transnational companies throughout the world. Now, industrialism introduces a division in third world societies, a schism in third world societies, where one section, which is the modern section, is aligned to the colonial imperial powers. And the traditional section, sector, is aligned to people, places, and nature, local. And this is a division that colonialism introduces within those societies. There is therefore an internal colonization that is supported by an external colonization. These real differences in industrialism in first world and third worlds must inform our search for alternatives. While we must always be open and willing to learn from every culture and intellectual tradition, we need to interrogate closely whether those ideas fit the realities of societies with colonial and imperial history. We cannot pluck ideas developed in a Euro-American context and expect it to work automatically in a third world. Our alternatives from, must come from within our specific realities. Self-determination is the starting point for our economic, social, and cultural development. This means we have a problem straight away. Alternatives for people in the third world have an external dimension and an internal dimension. Internally, we need to find ways of relating to our own natures, our own cultures, and our own histories for the economic, social, and cultural well-being of our people. When we begin to do that, however, inevitably, we face external aggression from the most destructive military powers of capitalist states. So the question is, how can we conceptualize alternatives that will enable us to retain the coherence of our natures, cultures, and labors, and at the same time, defend ourselves from the most destructive forces that human civilization has ever seen? It is useful to recall in this context that the post-World War world, which was described as the New World Order, was inaugurated by three events. And these are the three inaugural events of that moment. The first was the Holocaust. The second was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the third was the partition of India. The Holocaust demonstrated the destructive capacities that the coming together of the logic of industrial, uh, of, uh, industrial competition, the unpredictability of financial markets, and militarized state power make possible. That is what created that destructive capacity. Hiroshima and Nagasaki tested the destructive power of science commanded by a militarized state. It may be recalled here that Japan had already made an offer of surrender when the atom atomic bombings took place. So it's the nature of the institution that, that is em I'm emphasizing here. The partition of India, and in case some of you are not familiar with it, was the first sectarian war that was, came out of a democratizing mission by the imperial you know, British administration. The seeds of partition of the subcontinent were sown by colonial policies of what were used to be called responsible government at that time. Responsible government, much like democracy promotion today, 
introduced electoral systems based on communal electorates that classified people on basis of religion. So you had the entire subcontinent separated and two nations created, dividing Hindus and Muslims who had lived together for many, many centuries. So how do we develop strategies that are regenerative internally and at the same time develop capacities to re resist external aggression? And this is the fundamental problem of alternatives in third world countries for people who come from there. I will move on to the second point that I want to make on industrialism and democracy. With that introduction to my approach to industrialism, uh, I want to begin by remembering something that an ancient Tamil philosopher called, her name was Awayar, and yes, she was a woman philosopher. She said, build small and live big. That was her, you know, and she develops this into a beautiful verse, which I won't go into now. If you wish to live big, you must build small. Industrialism does the opposite. It builds big, and our lives get smaller and ever more meaningless in the institutional mazes that Kafka describes so beautifully. Industrialism and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. Industrialism is about large-scale production based on division of labor on a global scale. Industrialism relies on expansion of scales. Throughout history, Industrialism has sought to expand from local, regional, and glo to global scales of production, distribution, and consumption. Expanded scales of production, distribution, and consumption entail large-scale appropriation of natures and labors. Expanded scales of appropriation require large bureaucracies and professional armies that rely on command control mechanisms. They presuppose legal and institutional mechanisms that are removed from human mediations and rely instead on mediation by technology and modern law. So it displaces human beings and replaces it with technology and law. Large dams require large management, large investment from global investors, centralized states, and regional and international organizations. In the past decades, we have seen how these projects have led to repression and displacement everywhere. The Turkish state wishes to modernize the economy, but Elysium Dam displaces the Kurds. There are two competing conceptions of nature and human relationships to nature at that clash at that dam site. They are the Turkish states and the Kurdish peoples. What if a Kurdish state built the same dam? Would that make a difference? Now here I come to our experiences in the third world. Throughout the third world, we have seen states committed to decolonization, ending up doing what colonial states had done in the past. They believed in the idea of that capitalism is possible without colonialism, a concept that I really challenge. I mean, you know. And, uh, ended up, and what, what was the result? They ended up neither Euro with European-style industrial development nor with the national independence that they fought for. So they lost both. Large dams brought large-scale displacement and produced widespread protests and resistance. But this time, the resistance did not produce the powerful anti-colonial movements that shook the empires of the 19th century. So that, is, that was... Uh, and one has to ask why. Democracy, in contrast, entails participation. Participation by people in decisions about people who live in places. Places unify nature, labors, and cultures. Industrialism developed by rupturing the relations between natures and people. The primal rupture freed both nature and labor from ties to place. So it opened pathway for the commodification of both nature and labor and rendered both natures and labors placeless. 
technologies enable the water from my river in my backyard to be transferred to a different place. I could be living in a rich river valley uh, and not have water to drink because it has been taken over by some corporations and whatever. I'm going to go on now the, to the, the character of industrialism changed in the 20th century and industrialism transformed into militarism and the two world wars actually changed, became made militarism the driver of capitalism in the 20th century and that is where the link to imperialism today comes in. Large and large organizations are complexes of laws where power is concentrated in small nodes. Democracy on the other hand relies on contraction of scales. Democracy entails participation of people located in places, places as unifiers of labor, nature and culture. So the main argument, I have to skip a lot of this now because I've already got a five, my five minute notice so I will move on to just the, to the crux of my whole argument in this section is that technologies impose an architecture on societies. So you cannot have you know, a large technology and a democratic system because those technologies then demand kinds of institutional and other frameworks. The problem we have with uh, uh, industrialism is that industrialism conflates modernity and democracy. This conflation and association of modern, modernism and democracy is problematic. So the challenge is how do we de-link the two concepts of industrialism and democracy in public discourses and political practice? This is another question for alternative practice. I will now go on to just summarize the last uh, point that I want to make, which is on resistance with regeneration challenging law, science, and imperialism. The knowledge base, now the, in a sense, what I, uh, the knowledge base for industrialism comes from this body of knowledge that we call the European Enlightenment. Now, I don't want to go into the, all the differences and the new, uh, in the European Enlightenment, except to say that the European Enlightenment developed through its struggle against European feudalism. And therefore, the European feudalism uh, and the, the focus of the Enlightenment was the church and theology. So a lot of the European en en uh, Enlightenment is the antithesis of their struggle against the church and, and um, theology. And in some respects, what industrialism or, or modern science does, or Enlightenment science does, is to replace God with science and to replace uh, law, theology, with modern law or constitutionalism and that kind of thing. And that is why I think that the structure of enlightenment thought is still very much within the kind of discourses that is there that, that we see. And that because it was very much part of that European kind of tradition. This was not the case in the colonies. In the colonies, Colonial science destroyed the nexus between the natural world and the social world. Science was not the result of social transformations within the society, but rather the result of colonial introduction to expropriate nature and labor. The roots of modern science, therefore, are at best tenuous in the third world. Uh, the same goes for law. There is no such thing as society, Margaret Thatcher, who is a prophet of neoliberalism, said. The elevation of contract law is the essence of why there is no society. Because the more contract law becomes part of every branch of society, yeah, the more it, the cohesion of a social whole is destroyed. From space to the body, everything can be an object of contracts. There is an extensive body of law now on surrogacy contracts and how they should be written, if you talk to professional lawyers. Contracts between in international financial institutions like World Bank or IMF 
and third world states dictate the types of constitutional and legal changes that should happen in the third world states. So, uh, and one has to ask what is voluntary about a poor woman in a third world country agreeing to a surrogacy contract or ch a childless European couple or a poor man, you know, uh, 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 and, and, or a poor man who donates his kidney to a rich person because they have no other means to earn a livelihood. And law and science were central in, Europe, in, in, in Enlightenment thought. Much of modern knowledge developed from their conceptual framing of questions of human relationships to nature and to each other. In resisting feudalism, enli Enlightenment thinkers rebelled against ties to place. They rebelled against the sanctity of nature because that sanctity was dictated by God. They rebelled against natural law because it, was, it had its source in theology. But we have seen that that thinking has brought human civilization itself to a precipice and a point of destruction that cannot be underestimated or understated. National liberation movements believed that once the colonial rulers were removed, modern science and constitutionalism could be used for the well-being of their people. Instead, imperialism reappeared in neocolonialism and later in neoliberalism, largely through the conduit of science and technology and law and institutions. Similarly, socialist revolutions were inspirational in the political challenges to European capitalism. Socialist reconstru reconstruction relied on the same science and the same positive legal systems that the Enlightenment had produced. Socialists believed after removing capitalists from power, they could harness en uh, Enlightenment science and modern law to create a new, equal, and just society. Most farmers will recognize the saying that you cannot sow one seed and reap another fruit. It is the same with knowledge. Einstein said, no problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created the problem. We cannot use capitalist knowledge to build socialism or imperialist knowledge to exercise self-determination. In thinking about alternatives, the challenge is, can we go beyond the critique of economics and politics to interrogate the preconditions that sustain the kind of political economy we have? What are the presuppositions for the military industrial complex that we live in? What kind of knowledge do we need to build a society that is the antithesis of the Enlightenment, and where will this knowledge come from? So I'll stop there, except to say that I would have liked to also share some of our experiences from the people's science movement in India on what some of those alternate technologies might look like, what an alternate law might look like. These are more models in very small scale, but I hope that in the course of tomorrow and day after, when we have some of these discussions on community alternatives, I will get an opportunity to share that movement with you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um,